the middle of the Beatitudes really speak to me. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who are merciful, because they will be shown mercy. And so, especially over the topics we've been talking about, I just really pray that we as a people, a belie a believers, a community, and servants of Jesus, that we just look to be merciful with those around us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for, despite technology, Lord, you're not getting in the way of the Holy Spirit for me today. You are a good God. You are a merciful God. You took a broken man like me, and you showed me mercy, Lord. Help me to show mercy to those around me. Lord, we thank you for people in our community, in our church, who are showing mercy, Lord. We pray for Terry and Karen Johnson, who right now are on uh, their way to Kenya to provide medical care for people they've been re building relationships for years. We pray for our brothers and sisters at Unity Church, Lord, Gospel Culture, Grace Church, Compassion Churches, Lord, churches through our community meeting right now, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that you lift them up and encourage them. We pray for ministries in our community who are being your hands and feet, whether that's the Hope Centers or Faith Mission, Faith Refuge, Sick Ministries, Lord, whatever those are, Lord, we pray we continue to partner and look for ways to be merciful, to be your hands and feet, to be salt and light in a dark place, Lord. Helps to be people of hope, so we are able to show the hope of you that we are new creations, Lord. It's only through you, Lord. It's only through you. We thank you for that. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the ability to worship you this morning, Lord. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Everybody stand up for worship. Thanks.
let us bow down before him. His banner is over us. His mercies are new every morning, and I'll sing, oh, 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 oh. so we lift you high, forever lift you high, high within our heart, high within our mind, Jesus.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I have the pleasure of, of uh, being a father, and there's no question in my mind as to whether, whether or not I would give my life for my own kids. That's easy. That's super easy. But God, giving his only son to us, for us, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. I, it'd be hard for me to give my son for people I don't know, for people I've never met. And Jesus was so in tune with the Father. They had a game plan. Jesus was willing to put his life in place of ours, and that, that cross is heavy. It is. And a lot of us, we struggle with so many things that burden us to the point of wanting to give up or going ahead and, and saying that I don't believe anymore, you know? I've been troubled with that at times in my life. Um, when I read, it reminds me, when I read the Bible, it reminds me just how much God put on the line for us, how much Jesus in accordance with God was just, with his father, they had a game plan and they executed. So this song uh, is called How He Loves. And while we play this song, I want you guys to just remember what that love is like. Giving the most that you have, giving everything that you have, not, not just your time, you know, not just possessions, not just money, but the gospel, what the gospel required of, of Jesus was heavy. Every time he did a miracle, he was closer and closer to a Roman punishment. I want us to think about that type of love and just meditate on that when we sing this. Surprise. 
by the grace in his eyes if grace is a ocean we're all sinking so heaven needs a black and unforeseen kiss in my heart turned violent inside of my chest no I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about church Father God, we come to you today beaten up from the week or the week prior or the month prior or the year prior. God, we bring to you everything that's troubled us, that's weighed us down, that's caused us to stumble. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for leading us this morning, Michael. I, uh, I enjoyed meeting uh, three different couples this morning that have stumbled into Colonial Church for the first time, and it just reminds me that life keeps happening. And so I think about people I haven't seen in forever. Uh, some of you that are at home right now watching with us, I think about uh, new folks moving into the community, and I just don't have my brain there sometimes, especially in the middle of a pandemic, but it's happening. I think about friends who are going through loss and pain and yet celebrating life with people that love them. And uh, this is the church. So welcome to church. I'm glad you're here. Whatever has brought you to Colonial, whatever's brought you to whatever platform you're uh, joining us on, I'm glad you're here. Really glad you're here. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I do not believe that we stumble into these times and places by accident. I think God has something to say to us. I think God has something to say to me, and I forget that a lot of all people. So glad you're here. I do want to tell you, if you're new to us or if you haven't been with us in a while, you've stumbled in on a unique series we're doing. It's called We Don't Talk About That, Difficult Topics the Church Ignores. There's so many hot potato topics out there, and obviously most of them we're missing because you only have so much time. But we have stepped into a couple of subject matters these last few weeks. This is our last week for this series if you missed last week especially, I want to say this before we get into our teaching time today. Because we dealt with a movie, we watched part of a film together along with some teachings from a movie based on a book called Just Mercy uh, by Brian Stevenson. If you missed that and you want to go back, and I really encourage you to go back and, and watch it, or if you want to watch it again or share it with someone, we don't post it like we normally do, and it's there forever. You can look at it three years from now. We just post it for a couple weeks, and then we just kind of duck out of the corner, and it's not there anymore. Uh, and so if you want to go to colonialchurch.com slash live, it's been there all week, but as of tomorrow afternoon, we'll just go back and forth the rest of this week with 
Last week's service from the 21st of February, that will include that movie and teaching time. And then a couple hours later, it'll be this week's service. And then a couple hours later, it'll be last week's service. And then a couple hours later, it'll just go back and forth all week. And you can share that link with someone. Uh, you can watch it together. Uh, if you missed it, I really encourage you to go back and do that. Uh, I want to dive in today. David Youngblood, whom you're, you're going to meet him in a minute, he is a friend of mine. He is a pastor here in our community. He's a father. He's a husband. He's a brother in Christ. And I sat down with him this past week. We had all these plans to sit down and do this kind of extended discussion and film it and share it with you. And then I had a brief scare in my house. Uh, I already had COVID. My wife already had COVID, but we thought one of our kids might have it. So we quarantined for a couple days. Oh my goodness, is that getting old, right? And so uh, we ended up doing a Zoom video interview uh, and we recorded it. And so I'm eager to share parts of it with you this morning. Here's the beginning of my conversation with YB. When, we're, when you recognize that you have a brother or sister in Christ, you should be able to talk to them about anything mm. for the purpose of, of understanding. The Bible says in all you're getting, get an understanding. Mm. I'm with you there. Well, let's get an understanding. We'll do it. Okay. Come on. Come on. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining me uh, in a little hangout time, YB. Uh, I'm learning to call you David less and YB more coming around <laughs> as our friendship grows. Uh, I am, I don't know where you are. You look like you're in a cool place in your church. I am in my 13-year-old daughter's room with children's books behind me. And uh, it's the only place I could find in the moment to have some quiet. So, man, thanks for taking the time. Are you at your church right now? I am actually in the sanctuary. I am sitting in front of our sound booth uh, uh, doing this with the lights and everything. And so, uh, camera and stuff. This is why I had to find everything. They put it up. I was like, where y'all put it? So I had to. Uh, but Tell everybody who goes to Colonial that's part of our church community, where, where, is, where is Unity Church here in our city? Okay, Unity Church is actually located on Hollywood and Grant, um, which if I can give you landmarks, which is how I tell people how to get anywhere, the landmarks, is there is a Brahms and a Taco Bell on Kemp. If you yeah. go behind it, uh, directly behind it is Grant Street, and our church is right almost directly behind Brahms. Gotcha. So if you get back there, you'll see it. You'll see our church. We got signs. We've got We've got some long-time CrossFit Exoma people at our church. It's right down from where you are. Exactly. My kids have burned some of my cats over with Urban Air. I know, I know exactly where, where we're talking about. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> it's right well, um, I am grateful for our growing friendship. Um, I, I love that we've been pretty candid with each other right out of the gate mm -hmm. in, our, in our, our still growing new friendship. Uh, some of the hard things that have happened um, in our country around racial tension in the past year specifically. I guess, I guess the, uh, the incident, uh, oh my gosh, and I'm blanking on his name in Minneapolis. George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd. Yes. Revealing my ignorance there. George Floyd incident um, just sparked all kinds of conversation in all, all different circles, including ours. Yeah. And uh, I feel like even through the pandemic, as little as we've connected, we've been able to just talk real candidly about stuff. And I love that about you. Oh, I appreciate um, it. We talked about grief for a couple weeks, talked about the difficulty of taking off our, our masks and, and exposing our pain and what do we do with it? Where do we find help? How do we how do we support and minister to each other in our grief? Where, where's God in our grief? Uh, not controversial at all, but Still a really difficult topic. Right. This past weekend, however, we stepped into, for lack of a better way of putting it, more controversial uh, space because we used a different movie uh, and some teaching along with it from the scripture. Uh, I know you're familiar with what we've already talked about called Just Mercy, based on a book by Brian Stevenson, uh, Michael B. Jordan, the main character, the lawyer, the Harvard lawyer from up north. Uh, played played uh, the real life of Brian Stevenson in this film, 
And uh, I just want to come out of the gate and ask you some questions. First of all, have you, have you read the book? Have you seen the movie? What are your general thoughts on, on that true story and how it was, was shared with us? Seen the movie. Um, I actually could have done without seeing it. So he threw me off right out of the gate. I was so eager to talk to YB about this film, about this real story that happened. Uh, he's close to my age, he's a little younger, but I knew he was very familiar with it. And he tells me he could have done without seeing it. And then he goes on to explain a little bit of why. Um, but he got my attention early on in our discussion. Later this morning, I'm going to tell you how you can watch or you can listen to the entire interview. I'll make that really clear before we, before we leave our time together. Some of you are going to want to do that. But I do want to share a few snippets with you still. Like for Jeff Mercy, I, I will, I will this, this is probably one of the reasons it hit home so much for me is when the murder happened that Walter McMillan was accused of, falsely accused of, I was a junior in high school. So... Wow. I, I was just picturing where I was playing ball and with my girlfriend, with my family over dinner, and I was completely cool with that going on. Um, right. All my white friends, all my white friends, you know. And then when I, when that eventually came back to uh, his charges being dismissed that he was let let go, that was literally when my wife and I were engaged. We were 22 years old. We were planning our ceremony. All we had. We'll get blinders on, romance, life together, zero black friends, uh, completely clueless as to what's going on in Alabama. I did not watch 60 Minutes because I was 22. Who watches 60 Minutes when you're 22? I didn't see the story. I didn't read the news. I didn't have Twitter then, whatever. So, right. so my point is for me, I have these multiple moments reading the book and watching the movie going, this happened not that long ago. And I was clueless. And right, I don't know if that's right. the difference between me being a white guy over here in my world or, or what. Does that make any sense to you? It, it makes perfect sense because there, uh, I, I believe movies like this need to be made. Let me, let, me, let me say that. They need to be made. Stories need to be given because some people won't know unless they are. Um, for me, growing up, being aware of what's going on, it's like, I can't exhale from watching that movie. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I can't exhale from watching that movie is because when those that watch it, that, that are unaware of it, what goes on with racial uh, injustice in, uh, you know, in, in the justice system, um, uh, you'd be like, oh my God, thank God. Woo, who's good? Me, I'm like, okay, that's one. What about the other thousands? What about the yeah. other ones? You know, what about the one that's, that, that get killed while on death row that didn't get saved? And so I'm like, thank God for this one. And I praise God for the fact that this, 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 this man right here was, was exonerated. But man, how many times have I seen it to where it didn't even make it to, to, uh, to, uh, to the court system? Uh, I know I can tell you a story. I was in junior high, and I was living in Memphis, Tennessee. I, I, I believe this was—I believe this was the time frame. And um, there was a young man that was dating. He was a black young man dating a white girl, and this found out. And next thing you know, there was strange fruit hanging in a tree. And if no one, and, and for the audience that are going to watch that, you, you kind of can figure out what strange fruit means. That means he was hanging from a tree. Uh, all because of who he was dating. And this wasn't in the 70s. This wasn't in the 60s. This was in the late, the, uh, early 90s, late 80s. So, you know, I have stories of my own dealing with, with, with uh, injustice, you know, because of who I am and what I look like. Mm. In my own neighborhood where I lived, I lived there. And, and I was getting ready to go down to the docks. That's what we called it in Memphis. Been there, done that, worked with all. I mean, I've had everything talked about me, said to my face. And a lot of times we can't respond because in our response, we egg it on and what they really want to do ends up happening. And so, or I look like an angry black man. 
as somebody that, you know, you just angry. And that's not the case. It's just sometimes you get frustrated. So movies like that are necessary so that people can see it. But like I said, you know, individuals like me and a lot of individuals, a lot of black men, a lot of black people, when we see stuff like that, we don't exhale. We just say, well, thank God for that one. Now let's work on the rest. We don't exhale. I, I want to talk today about something very difficult for all of us. I think every single one of us. And, and then I want to simply take us back to Jesus because we need to always come back to Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's what matters. Jesus is everything. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the giver of every good and perfect gift that we are all remotely thankful for. Jesus is the reason we can experience forgiveness and uh, freedom in him, new life in him. Jesus is the reason we can have hope for our future despite circumstances. Uh, Jesus is everything. And central to who Jesus revealed God to be, central to what Jesus' life looked like in the flesh when we read the Gospels, central to who Jesus calls us to become as his people is this concept of compassion. I've got a way too long definition I want to throw at you of this concept of compassion. Compassion is being moved at one's gut level depths by the pain or bliss of another and responding in ways that intend to ease their suffering or promote their flourishing. I know that's a mouthful, but there's really two things that, that are involved in compassion. It's something we experience inside of ourselves, something that moves inside of us, and then it's the actions we take in response to whatever we're feeling, whatever we're experiencing on the inside. Something we experience inside, and something we do in response to that internal experience. So inside, being moved at one's gut level depths by the pain of another, by the suffering, or by the bliss, by the joy uh, of another. It's why when someone scores a touchdown on my favorite team, there's something that wells up inside of me. When, when someone is hurting that I care about, there's something that wells up inside of me. We see the imagery of a dirty, hurting, hungry child. We hear the cries of a friend who's in pain. We watch a child excel on a stage or on a playing field. I got to go to a high school playoff basketball game yesterday and watch my, my daughter cheer. And there's something that just wells up inside of me. Or sitting with a loved one who is sick. I got to visit my dad who's got COVID and pneumonia on Friday. We experience something inside and we're moved at one's gut level depths, either by their pain or their bliss. And the second component, we do something about what we're feeling, responding in ways that intend to do one of two things, that intend to ease their suffering or promote their flourishing. This is compassion. In the Old Testament portion of the Bible, God is described as having compassion over a dozen times. If we read the gospel accounts, uh, the life of Jesus, uh, Jesus is described as one filled with compassion six times. There's a bunch of other stories of Jesus where they don't use the word compassion, but the picture is so clear of his heart of compassion. Luke particularly writes about a, a Sabbath day when Jesus was teaching in the local synagogue where all the Jews would come together to worship. So for them, it was a Saturday. For us, it'd be like Sunday morning church. Jesus is there teaching in the Saturday synagogue gathering. And while he was teaching, Jesus saw a woman who was bent over and could not stand up straight. Evidently, something happened inside of Jesus because he immediately stopped teaching all these people, and he called out to her and he healed her right there in the moment. Now, I don't know about you, but I can, I can identify with this bent over, crooked back uh, woman in more than one way. Uh, first of all, um, man, getting older is not so fun. I, I, uh, it's, it's humbling how much my back issues are coming up. I hurt my back playing football in high school, which was back in the 1980s. In the 1980s, you could have a bone sticking out of your leg and the coach is like, get back in there, you know? Uh, that's just the culture that I grew up in. So I fractured my L5 vertebrae in high school and the doctor missed it. They said, oh, it looks like maybe a pinched nerve. Let's give him a shot of cortisone. And I got back out there and I played ball for the rest of my junior year with a broken back. 
And every two, three, four years, it just flares up again for no good reason. Usually it's because I helped somebody move um, or I, I did something because I thought I'm still 25 in my head. Uh, we had some kind of snowstorm recently and I thought I'd shovel. Like who saw that coming, right? And sure enough, a couple days later, I'm on the living room floor and my daughters are all freaking out because their big strong dad is in agony, crying like a little baby, can't find any back pain people, you know what I'm talking about, you just can't find that comfortable spot. I can identify, I can relate to this bent over woman who could not stand up straight. I can also relate in that I often feel bent over with the weight of responsibility of my work. Uh, I often feel bent over with the weight of sadness about things that are going on in the lives of people that I care about, friends, and family. I feel overwhelmed sometimes by the weight of how messed up the world is. It's just heavy, including how divided we can be as brothers and sisters in Christ who are supposed to show the world what it means to, to love each other. It just grieves me. It's just so heavy. Way too often, I feel like I'm unable to stand up straight in my soul, if I'm honest. Luke chapter 13, verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Now, the, the English standard version, I think, does, does better job of translating this little originally Greek phrase. Uh, sometimes we've got to look to different translations to really help us understand the meaning but the English Standard Version uh, shows us that it really means to be set free from, to be released from, from this bondage, this prison. So the ESV says, woman, Jesus said, woman, you are freed from your disability. You are set free. How badly do I long to be set free by, by the anxiety, the pressures I feel at times? And how grateful am I already that God has freed me, has given me experiences of the fullness of joy multiple times over the last 31 years of, of following Jesus. Then Jesus touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. I'll bet she did. I'll bet, I'll bet you thought she scored a touchdown, right? Well, when Jesus saw this woman as she came into the synagogue, clearly he felt something well up inside himself for her, and then he healed her. And this shows us, as Jesus does over and over again, it shows us the heart of God, it shows us the compassion that God has for his people. He saw that she was bent over. He was moved by her circumstances, and he acted to make her circumstances better. That's compassion. This combination of being moved on the inside and then acting in response, it's the definition, it's the essence of compassion. Now, unfortunately, a story about Jesus wouldn't be complete without some really riled up religious people, because that's what happened. Can you guys remember that? Jesus never really upset the non-religious people. He upset people like us. He upset people like me. <laughs> what Jesus did that day on the Sabbath, the holy day of the week, set aside for worship and rest, that ticked off the leader of this Jewish synagogue. And, and the reason for that is over several hundred years leading up to this time, of, leading up to the birth of Jesus, Jewish leaders had systematized this idea of Sabbath, this holy day. It's what we do. It's what religious people do. We, we just add a bunch of do's and don'ts, add a bunch of rules and clear parameters and boxes because it just, it feels a little better. It feels a little more clear. It's a little more way we can control. It's the human condition. And this is what they did. They came up with 39 different actions that are off limits on the Sabbath. 39 very specific things. No, 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 don't do that. It wasn't from the Bible. It wasn't from God. It was just let's, just, let's just get real clear about what you can and can't do on this holy day. One of them was healing. Not allowed to do that, what Jesus just did. Now, spoiler alert, I love this about Jesus. Jesus broke the rules of the Sabbath all the time multiple times. And every time it was an act of compassion when he did. Go find a couple and see, yeah, that's, wow, that's, that's what compassion looks like. He not only showed compassion for this particular woman in this case, this bent over woman when he healed her, but he showed compassion for 
all the Jewish people as he reframed this, this central idea in their religion, this idea of Sabbath. The Sabbath was originally meant to be a day of rest and celebration for God's people, freedom for God's people. But these religious leaders had turned it into a day of obligation. Does that sound familiar to any of us super religious people? It, it just shifted into do's and don'ts. It shifted into this, this restricted experience. And Jesus reframed it as a day of freedom and compassion. So this particular leader of the synagogue is all ticked off and he criticizes Jesus. And then verse 15 says, the Lord replied, you hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? By the way, that's one of the 39. You're not supposed to do that. This dear woman a daughter of Abraham, he gives her dignity. She's a, she's a Jewish woman. She's chosen by God. This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage for, by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released, set free, even on the Sabbath? Now, there's a lot to unpack there. I just want to grab hold of one thing. Don't miss this. Jesus noted that this woman had suffered for 18 years. How did he know that? Did, did he heal her? And she's like, oh, 18 years I've been waiting for this. I don't know. Luke didn't write that down. Uh, did he just supernaturally know? Because he is God in the flesh. I always wonder, what did Jesus know? What did he not know? I don't know. Either way, Jesus engaged his imagination to enter into what it must have been like for her to have a, a curved back for 18 years. Let me say that again. I, I think this is really important. Jesus engaged his own imagination in that moment to enter into what it must have been like for her to have a crooked back for 18 years. This is an important component of compassion called empathy. Empathy defined as the cognitive process of identifying with or vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. I know that's another way too long definition. One more time. Empathy is the cognitive process. It's, it's what's going up, up here in the brain on purpose. We don't drift into this. You choose to, to think it, choose to make it happen up in the brain. The cognitive process of identifying with or vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. I like how another writer uh, defines it a little more simply. Entering into and participating in the story of another. Empathy is entering into or participating in the story of another. I want to jump back to my conversation with YB this week. Thanks for leaning in and listening. I know the audio is a little funky. Uh, I blame myself for that. Uh, but YB and I are trying to do just this. To enter into and participate in each other's stories. And I, I know we're both very aware of, okay, don't say that word or you just lose everybody. Or don't say that word they all can't right. think it. Here's my concern mm -hmm. is that I am very certain that a chunk of people in my tribe can hear you say what you just heard and immediately go, oh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure there's more to it than that. There's no way that... It, there wasn't. Like, <laughs> but but here's, here's my point. is like, <laughs> instead of choosing to believe, that might just be true. You know, like, like when you say 20,000 in prison and only 5,000 are supposed to be there. I mean, I'm not going to take you to task on, okay, where did that number come from and what's accurate? Right. Am, I, am I willing, am I willing in my cluelessness or maybe even in my informed convictions to go, okay, what if that's true? Okay, my, my friend here believes that. My friend might even know that to be true, and I don't know it yet. But regardless, am I, am I capable in a conversation together of, of entertaining the possibility that what you're saying is true? Instead, we get triggered, and we start doing this so quickly. Does that, I, I, I can write you off. I can hear people behind me writing you off. Five minutes. You know, or, I agree. or this, this happened to the rich white guy, and this happened to the poor black guy. Ah. I'm not buying it. Instead of, what if there's truth to that? Well, that, you, that you know what? It, it, it is crazy. It, it's crazy because you're right, because that's on both sides. That's on both sides. You'll have one that'll say, no, that couldn't be. 
because they couldn't fathom it being. Then you have others that are that'll run down the street and exaggerate. No, man, get it happen. But it's true. I mean, you have it happen at Stanford and you had it happen at Vanderbilt. Young man raped a girl that was unconscious in at Stanford. He got off with probation. The young man, black young man in Vanderbilt, he's in prison. Mm. Same thing. <laughs> Identical. And it's like, mm. whoa. And, and so I sit back and what I what and what I try to do is one, you can't paint everybody with the brush. You cannot put everybody in the same category and you can't make everybody out to be uh, disbelievers or those that that uh, uh, support what's happening. And I think that's a dangerous thing that happens. Mm -hmm. But because I see you and you look like or you represent what I've seen and what, what has happened or the culture that comes with it, we paint people with the same with the same brush that we that we're given or that we've or has been given for that culture. And so for me to say, man, man, Lauren, I knew I know he ain't gonna understand what I'm talking about. That's wrong. I can't I can't paint you with the with uh, or, or label you with the inability to understand my plight uh, just because you're white. That that's not fair to you. You may not have walked in my shoes, but it doesn't mean you don't see that they're dirty. I think why I, I heard somebody over here. I like that guy. I could hear that. <laughs> I think YB hit something on the head here. Uh, for me, anyway, how do, we, how do we empathize with someone if we haven't walked in their shoes? I just can't relate to everybody who's different than me. I can't know their story. I can't fully grasp it. If this is central to our understanding of what it means to be the people of Jesus, how can we choose to empathize? A couple thoughts. One is we can cultivate curiosity about strangers, and all the introverts in the room just threw up in their mouth a little bit, okay? But stick with me. I realize this is going to come a lot more easily for us who are extroverts, but what if, here's a question, what if following Jesus includes choosing to have an insatiable curiosity about strangers? What if we refuse to lose the natural inquisitiveness that we all had as children? Remember when we used to all ask questions all the time? I think the world just beats it out of us. Do you know the average four-year-old asks 2,000 questions a day? Some of you moms are like, yes, I do, <laughs> right? How come we don't do that anymore? That number just goes down, down, down as we get older. It's because the world beats out of us. We start out as kids really curious, really inquisitive. What if we hold on to that? What if we regain it? it's lost? What if we choose on purpose to talk to people outside of our usual social circles to encounter people with different stories, different worldviews that are than our own? And I'm not talking about quick, easy, superficial chats about the weather or the cowboys or whatever. We do some of that, right? I'm talking about trying to understand the world inside that person's head and heart. What if we courageously cultivate curiosity about strangers? And what if we seek to understand people different from ourselves? Not just talk to them, but really understand them or, or, or try really hard to understand them. YB got real about this, and uh, it just makes me think I have so far to grow in this area, even in my friendship with YB. When you, are, when you, when you dress a certain way and you speak a certain way, um, and, and man, you asked me to be real honest. I, I guess I got to. Um, and I know how to speak with, with slang and, uh, and, and talk, you know, you know, with different, you know, colloquialisms and different things that have to deal with uh, my culture, you know, the culture that I, I'm a part of. I, I choose not to. My kids tell me I need to stop because I don't sound right, you know. Yeah, I, I don't have it down right like them. But it is in the way I present myself, the way I dress, the way I act, and what I say. It becomes, watch this, I'm going to use a word, and I know it's going it, it to, may, it may put you in a sense of a little at ease, but trust me, we're good. I'm looked at as a tolerable black man. Mm. 
I can tolerate him. He's good. Uh, and, and what we used to be called is different back in the day. Um, we're not going to say that. <laughs> but I'm a tolerable black man. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, I feel safe around him. He doesn't look like he's a threat. I, I appreciate your candor. Um, I mean, I'm, I think I'm a little closer to the camera, so it looks like I'm bigger than you. You're a big dude. And, you know, I, I can, I mean, can, can we be this real? You, you've yeah. got, you know, some sweatpants on and a tank top. And um, there's a lot of folks that are crossing the street, you know, I get it. on the other side. I you, get it. You've got, you, you, you dress the way you, you dress most of the time I see you. And that this whole tolerable black man, it, it makes it more makes sense, sense to me than I, I want to admit. You know? it, 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 it happens to me all the time. The clutching of the purse, the locking of the door, still to this day, uh, to see me coming, uh, to stare me down, to see what I'm, what I'm wearing, what I'm doing, how I'm presenting myself, to listen to me talk. I had someone tell me, wow, you sound, you speak well. Was I not supposed to? Mm. And so... <laughs> and so, you know, that, that's the thing. If you want to know something, if you want to get just from a, a cultural background, that's not something I, I want to hear. Please don't tell me I speak well. As it, it, to me, the first thing I take it as, uh, you, what did you expect? Mm. You speak with such clarity. Oh, my goodness. Wow, you sound so... Well, thank you. What did you expect from me? Did you expect me to... To sound differently. Mm. I'm very convicted of how much work, how much intentionality is required, is necessary to really empathize with people that are just different than us. This is just one example of differences. As we saw in the film last week, just like we see in the life of Jesus outlined in the Gospels, it comes down to each of us leaving our comfort zones and stepping into the worlds of other people. This, this is the gospel lived out, by the way. Choosing curiosity, choosing to try to understand people different than ourselves. This only happens when we choose proximity. We talked about this last week. We choose to leave our comfort zone, our space, and step into their space. It actually makes me think of our radical minimums, which we, we talk about sporadically, uh, don't worry about all these other radical minimums. I want to grab a hold of this last one, engaging purposely. Part of what we believe here at Colonial Church is that we are to engage purposefully, to engage in a purposeful meal, drink, or activity with someone each week. It's not because you get a merit badge for that. It's because we want, to, we want to build friendships. We want to seek to understand people different than us. We want to leave our comfort zones to where they are, where the needs are. YB had something to say about this. And before he says this word, I want to remind you of a couple things. He's our brother in Christ. He is uh, a student of the scriptures, just like you and me. He has the Holy Spirit of God living inside him, discerning truth and helping him interpret things. And he's a pastor who's been called and equipped by God to lead some people, I would even argue, including us here in our community. So listen to what YB has to say. We cannot be true disciples of Christ and then isolate ourselves. There's no way to impact lives and be isolated and insulated within the own confines of what's comfortable to us. Um, and so in order to really make an impact, uh, we've got to get out of our comfort zones. We've got to get to where those that need God. And let me say this, and I'm going to say this, and I mean it with all of my heart. God is just not needed in the, the poor areas. God is needed in the rich areas. God is needed in those that are, that, that are fluent, that have, that have, that have money. Those, just because the money doesn't mean that you're mentally stable, that you got everything right in your relationships, that everything is cool with you. There could be some issues going on that no one knows about. There could be medical issues, uh, psychological struggles. And so for me, Wherever the need is, we've got to insert ourselves or get ourselves within proximity enough to touch the people. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, it, we cannot be effective and be unreachable mm -hmm. and, and not be able to touch out and, and reach out and touch people. And this is why I, I, 
I, every day I keep wondering why we keep building more and more churches, buildings, what I mean, and big uh, edifices because we find ourselves isolated within the walls of it and not going out there and put hands on people mm. that really need it. Um, and I, I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. It's one thing for, for people to come to their, their service. Well, I'm going to my service on Sunday and I'm going to get there and you check off the box and yeah, good. But what about the day-to-day -day interaction with God and with those in need? Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. Well, I'm very convicted about this. Uh, I agree with YB. This, this is central. I'm, I'm, I have no doubt this is central to what God wants for you and for me. He does want to build his church. Probably not how we think he wants to build his church. He wants to build his people. He wants to build a movement of empathetic Jesus lovers. If you heard me say pathetic, that's another sermon. Uh, we are kind of a hot mess, okay? I don't mean pathetic. I, right now, I mean empathetic. People who can empathize and who love Jesus. People who are cultivating curiosity about strangers. People who are seeking to understand people different from ourselves. People who are choosing to leave our comfort zones and to get up close and personal with people. Not, for example, shouting from a distance online. Can we stop doing that? That's not working. Not staying safely within our own little tribes who all agree with each other. That feels good. It's not impacting the kingdom. I believe God wants us to be others-centered goers. We huddle up here so we can get a game plan, and then we go, and we love. Specifically, a couple other thoughts, to pay serious attention to what people are saying, people who are different than us, what they are saying. I don't know about you, but I can so... I'm going to preach to myself for a minute here. I can so quickly blow off somebody because they use a particular word or they just step into that subject matter and I'm like, oh, I'm out, I'm done. What if I don't do that? What if, what if I choose to be patient and humble and curious? What if I choose to listen to the words that are coming out of this person's mouth, even if I completely disagree and I show them I care just by listening? Doesn't mean I agree. What if I also pay serious attention to what they feel about what they are saying? Even if I have no idea why they feel that way. Even if I can't fathom why they would feel that way. What if we choose to be listeners and learners? Doesn't that come into, into line with what we know from, from Jesus and humility, the humility he wants for us, the humility that he modeled to be listeners and learners? Okay. I, oof, I sheepishly want to share one other moment I had with YB, and I know I'm going to get an email or 10 about this one. Um, I'm half joking, but I hope this is really helpful. I really hope this is helpful. I, I want to learn how to better understand people that are different than me. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can contextualize it for me as a newbie to Wichita Falls. You know, only, only a dummy... Only a dummy would move into a new town and and try to turn everything upside down and make something happen. I mean, I have come in um, tr trying to be purposeful and flow and seeking to understand. I know I know quite a bit about West Texas because I got West Texas family. I grew up Southern Baptist. We're at Southern Baptist Church. Um, I grew up around military people from age 10 through 18, living in Europe. So I understand military town. Uh, and then having said all that, I've never lived in Wichita Falls. I've never lived in a city of 100,000. I've never lived in this particular community with its unique challenges and history. Right. Um, and so all that to say, part of my role as a leader is to seek to understand our community and our culture, uh, and then to reach out to people like UYB that are not only on the surface different by the color of our skin, but we just have different stories. And we have different different lenses through which we see the world. And so right. my heart as a kingdom builder is to, to know and love people different than me and, and to stretch our people outside of our little tribe, outside of our little comfortable place. Right, right, and seek right. to understand. I want to model this real quick. Um, okay. 
and I want to dare to say a term that's going to trigger everybody. Okay. Um, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be divisive or, or make a splash or anything like that. I really am trying to model what does it look like for a stereotypical pasty white guy to ask my black friend that I trust will, will know where I'm coming from. What does BLM mean to you? I'm not asking for the right answer or the only answer. I, I'm seeking to understand your perspective okay. on this term that has become huge in our culture oh, yeah. and means di very different things to different people. Um, somebody just turned me off. The rest of them are still with us. Um, what, what is BLM, Black Lives Matter? What does that mean to you, Webby? Black Lives Matter, it is simply this. The lack of understanding or acknowledgement that there is some some differences there's some differences that happen in the justice system and in and in this uh, systematic racism in things in this world in this country in our united states is not acknowledged enough it is not recognized and it's been basically ah, okay you know right to vote yeah okay you know we took away segregation, you know, Jim Crow was gone, you know, yeah. And then to act, it, it, it is, okay, but you act like everything is good. No, listen, Black Lives Matter also. And so it is not the understanding that the only Black people matter. Because I, I talked to a couple of friends of mine, I said, that is a dangerous thing to say. Because when you start getting into uh, Wait, what, what is a dangerous thing to say? What is a dangerous thing? Black Lives Matter only. Oh. Which, yeah. which I will interject as a, as a white guy with a lot of white friends. I think that's what white people hear a lot. Is, right. I, I know you just used three words, but in my brain, I heard you say Black Lives Matter only, or only. Black Lives Matter more, or Black Lives right. Matter. Right. And that do. is, that's a misconception. It, 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 the original intent of it was to bring, to highlight. Look at this. You have a paper that you wrote. You went to college, I went to college. We got a paper we wrote, but the professor graded the paper and skipped over the middle paragraph. Act like the middle paragraph doesn't exist. The whole paper is necessary. But Black Lives Matter says, listen, don't throw out the paper. I just want to highlight that paragraph so you recognize that it's there too. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That's a good picture. And so it's basically putting a highlighter on, listen, Black Lives Matter is also. Don't get so tunnel vision that you fail to see that there is some wrong and some injustices that are happening. Mm. Don't overlook, don't just assume that what you see somebody asked for or it's justified. No, it's not. Every time you see somebody getting pulled over, every time you see somebody getting arrested, or every time, everybody's not resisting. Everybody's not doing wrong. Everybody's not guilty. And so sometimes, and this is what's crazy, and this is what I truly believe. There are, I think there are less racial, racist people in this country than there was before. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a lot of people that just believe that, okay, it is what it is and just move on. To ignore injustice is to agree with it. To, to just act like it's, you know, it's supposed to happen is to agree with it. We've heard the saying, silence is agreement. Mm -hmm. You don't say nothing, you agree. And so that's the thing. Listen, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you think that we're supposed to get stepped on the neck like that or we're supposed to get beat like that, is that? No, listen, Black Lives Matters. Hey, can yeah. you, hey just want to let helpful, you know. That, that's helpful to me to hear you say, okay, if silence is agreement, uh, I want to say something. I want to say, I'm, I'm going to choose to say Black Lives Matter. And you're not saying, I, I confess, this is, hard, this is hard for me because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to speak for a lot of my white 
friends but you can't. in my tribe. I can't because if you I can only sleep for long. That's not fair to them. But, <laughs> right. but what's hard for me is I don't associate it with the organization. Can you speak to that? Because I think a lot of, I don't know if it's a cop out or it's just a misunderstanding. A lot of folks go, yeah, but have you seen the, the bullet point list of what BLM stands for? For example, the, the destruction of the nuclear family. That's the first thing we jump to sometimes in those arguments. And, and for example, yeah, I hate that. Like there's aspects of that organization I got major problems with, but I don't even associate that organization with this term. Right. I see somebody's t-shirt that says BLM. I don't think of the organization. I think of right. my black friends. I think of, I think of the, the, the unique challenges of, of black people in our culture. I don't think of them. Does that resonate with you in that? That makes sense. Do you think that and, and this is the of truth. organization? I don't know anything about the organization to that point because I'm not a part of the organization. <laughs> See, I think you just blew somebody's mind because yeah. I'm black and I'm not a part of the organization. You're <laughs> black and you don't know anything about that organization. I don't like because it, it, it. There are a lot of radical people that come up with a lot. The origination of the of the uh, of Black Lives Matter is different than what it has uh, evolved into. That was my favorite moment in, I think, in our growing new relationship, uh, the look on his face when I'm like, what do you think about this organization, Black Lives Matter? And he's looking, I don't know if you saw his face, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It could be this issue, it could be a lot of different issues. To wrap our brains around this people group and this people group fighting about something, the entire time not knowing they're talking about two different things. That blows my mind certainly misunderstanding each other at the very least. What if, let's get back to Jesus, what if following Jesus includes compassion? Choosing proximity with people, including people very different than ourselves, becoming listeners, becoming learners. What if letting the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's in you as a follower of Jesus well up within you and then responding like Jesus would? What would Jesus do with those convictions, with those strong feelings? I can't think of a better way to end. Yes, we are landing the plane. I can't think of a better way to end our teaching time here today than sharing with you just about a minute and a half of YB and his prayer for you and his prayer for me. Uh, let's check this out. I would say this to you. I would say this to you. I pray for Colonial to have their woman at the well experience. What do you mean by that? I must go through Samaria, some Samaria, Samaria. I must go there. I must go through. He wasn't supposed to talk to them. They weren't supposed to connect at all. He, he was supposed to go around. He was supposed to go around. You're not supposed to go in that, that area of town. You're not supposed to talk to those, those people over there. You're not supposed to deal with those people. They, no, you got to go around. You know, Jesus said, I got to go through here because there's somebody that's different that I got to minister to. The woman, not only was she Samaritan, which he wasn't supposed to talk to. She was one that slept with different men, had different men. So not only was she considered dirty, because this is the reason why she came to the well at 12 noon versus in the morning with everyone else because of how people viewed her. So not only did she not look like Jesus, she was considered dirty and unclean. And to even be seen with her is to be associated with somebody of that mag of that character. And so my prayer is, is that Colonial gravitates at, with their leader and they have the Samaritan woman at the well experience, meaning they go after that very one that people say you're not supposed to talk to, you're not supposed to interact with, and you're not supposed to be associated with because they don't look like you, they, they haven't always acted like you and their past says it's not like like it's supposed to be and it's when we get the church gets an understanding that we are to be going after the well every day i want to meet who's at the well every day then we are really be the church preach <laughs> bless you <man. laughs> let's let's pray together Father, thank you for new friends. Thank you uh, on behalf of all of us, Lord. Thank you for the ways you are never done with us. You are never done stretching us, never done 
growing us up, convicting us of our sin, uh, calling us to repentance, calling us to humility, calling us to act, calling us to trust you more. Thank you for that. Lord, I, uh, I have this strange sense of confidence that you've had your hand over this, this topic, this conversation these few weeks. I know we had people walk out the last Sunday morning. And I don't know why, but you do. You know hearts. You are at work in every single one of us. And you can not only speak through film, through your scriptures, through our friends and neighbors, through our small group members, uh, through people like me with a microphone, you can even speak in spite of us. You can lead us supernaturally to where you want us to go. So we just trust you. We trust you to do the work you want to do in us. Lord, would you make your church more and more a movement of your people who are chasing after relationships with folks that are loving each other well and modeling to the world what love really looks like, what generosity really looks like, as well as chasing after people that are very different than us. It doesn't even make sense to a watching world. Would you make us known more for our love that looks like you, grace that looks like you, than our judgmentalism, our hypocrisy that dishonors your name? Father, please don't, don't stop changing us. Don't stop working on us. Father, we just wrap up our time together to huddle up before we, we scatter and be your church this week. And uh, Father, we choose right now, all of our people, even at home, we just we lift up a hand. We lift up a hand as we do almost every week here at Colonial. And just say, Father, I, I, I think of a handful of things. I choose in the middle of my, my struggle whether it's uh, the pandemic or it's emotional or it's just in the wake of loss of people we love or frustrations, Father, with ourselves. Lord, we just lift up a hand and, and turn our heads toward you and, and thank you. Thank you for a few gifts. Right now, would you hear our prayer as we thank you for a handful of things, big and small? Hear our prayers right now, Father. Thank you. Thank you for being so generous. Thank you for blessing us more than we realize. We choose to thank you in the moment. Father, we close our fist to just physically represent our own sin, our own uh, ways we hold back from you and live for ourselves. Uh, I, I confess my sin, Father. I confess that every day I have to recommit myself to surrender again, to choose to trust you, so I open my hand, Father. We open our hand. We open them and say, lead us, take us, mold us, change us. Make us your people that we would leave uh, this spot on Maplewood Avenue and we would go all over the greater Wichita Falls area and we would love people in a way that makes you grin ear to ear. That we would proclaim your good news and your hope to people who need to hear it today. Oh, that you would humble us and give us a faith that we lack. All these things, Father. All these things, Father. Including, including the money we give today, the, the ways we, we love our family and our friends on the way home today, the little things, Father. We just give it all to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for being with us. Before you scatter... I, lo I love the few scattered golf claps. That's always good. <laughs> Thank you, new folks, for being with us today. So glad you got the journey with us. I, I, I trust there's this groundswell of people coming back to church. There's, some, there's, there's rumors that things are going to get better. I have no idea either. But I'm excited. Easter's a few weeks away. Come talk to one of these folks. Come pray with people in person here. Ooh, come pray with people up here. Our response team would love to answer questions point you to some things. If you're online with this, go to our app, click on connect, bunch of options there that you can request prayer, you can follow up, you want to you trust Jesus for the first time, come talk to some of these folks. We would love to celebrate with you and do life with you. Uh, one last clarifying statement, if you want to watch this entire interview, we're going to push it out through our app, we're going to post it on Facebook, and we're going to email it to everybody. So if you've got your notifications of any kind set up within about 24 hours, sometime tomorrow afternoon, that's going to come out to you so you can enjoy the whole interview if and when you want to. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. You guys have a fantastic week.